It's just incredible to see everyone here. I've got everything from family to old family friends and mentors and uh, my martial arts instructor. Um, completely incredible. So um, Diane told me 15 to 20 minutes, which is a pretty huge canvas for some of these little essays. So I know that there are two I can do um, in their entirety and I'll run a clock on myself to see if I um, can get time to pull a little more um, kind of local color out of one of the, the summer essays, but you'll hear me um, kind of in conversation with some other writers in these two essays. And so I'll be talking to with about uh, Mary Oliver, some really classic poems from her book, 12 Moons, and also a poem of Ivy Francis's, which is collected here in Horse in the Dark, which is a completely incredible poetry collection as well. Um, so here we go. This essay is called January, Raccoons and Salmon. A raccoon is a nice animal, asks Chiragi. She's looking at me uncertainly across my desk. I suddenly appreciate how utterly North American Mary Oliver's poetry is. Chiragi's is an understandable question given the way Oliver treats her raccoons, silvery, slumberous. What if this gray dreamer was your first raccoon, his tiny paws on the riverbank spreading the myths of the morning in the delicate hieroglyphs of his tracks? I remember how years ago, a British friend asked me with rising agitation, I don't get it, is a raccoon a cat or a dog? It struck me then, as it strikes me now, what wonders we grow up so inured to. Oliver's poetry works in implicit contrast to our daily underestimation of the world. When I teach raccoons, I strive to help students recognize how Oliver's art asks us to see the world anew. I solicit students' usual associations with raccoons. In response to Chiragi's question of whether a raccoon is a nice animal, I supply some of the things her classmates said on the day she was absent. Raccoons come out at night and raid trash cans and rampage in campsites. If you see one in the daytime, it might have rabies. She's a nursing student and she nods her head gravely when I mention rabies, weighing contagion against awe. Ah, it can give disease. I run a quick Google image search for raccoons and prefer the laptop screen. We match the images to Oliver's descriptions, breathing back into the raccoon a little of the wonder that the specter of rabies has just foreclosed. We turn to the next poem. When I teach the fish, I can usually count on some sportsman or woman to say with a glow of pleasurable recognition that the fish is a salmon. This poem runs on wonder too inviting us to marvel at how the salmon can trace this river to its tributaries and choose at every branching the path that leads to her own birthplace. Outside my office, the wind blows fine snowflakes in white swirls across a landscape of waist-high drifts. Where Chiargi grew up in Anand, India, it doesn't snow, but here the winter will last through April at least. The colorless season and its muffled sunlight feel a long way away from the dry winters and monsoon summers of Western India or from the brightness of a summer salmon run. I try to give her the ecology, how out of the great ocean, out of all the rivers and all their tributaries, the spawning salmon ascends against the current, against all odds to the place where she began life as egg and alvin and fry. But even to know her life cycle is not enough. A salmon's journey has meaning beyond the reproduction of one fish. It speaks to an intact watershed, unsevered by dams. Her life makes one piece, together with the other members of her species, of an abundant spawning run. Five such species together make the succession of spring, summer, and autumn salmon runs, the resource base that fattens grizzly bears and enables the life ways of the people of Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. Up in Alaska, a land I know only by legends of ecology, anthropology, and Klondike gold rush literature, my brother works for the Fish and Wildlife Service to restore streams and give them back their salmon runs. My eyes are misted after I finish telling Chiragi what a salmon is. I do not use Google this time. All the orange fleshed fillets or silvery leaping fish will not show how a salmon is 300 miles of open stream and 10,000 years of human dependence on the earth's bounty. In contrast to most of my students, Chiragi needs no gloss for Oliver's slightly archaic simile, seeing this fish as like the body of any woman come to term. Chiragi plans to return to India after her graduation and work as a neonatal nurse in a rural clinic. A smile breaks across her face and she says, it's quite deep, it's quite lovely. She tells me of how a mother's joints are altered by carrying a child to term. 
I had not thought to see the poem's shaken bones so particularly. I'm grateful. I have never known what to make of this sudden turn in Oliver's poem, its final pivot to the celebration of the trans species feminine strength to give life, one that transmutes the fish's upstream journey into a labor agony. I have never been, will never be that fish. I have a fraught relationship with ecofeminism when it indulges in gender essentialism, valuing both women and earth for supposedly sharing core qualities of nurturance and fertility. I have been living with this poem for years now, as one after another, my friends have embarked upon their upstream journey against mortality, their very skeletons changed forever by the life they have nurtured within, their own lives brushed by possible deaths with names like placental abruption and preeclampsia. I have never felt the need to test the fierce waters of those streams, but now at 32, there are some things I finally understand, what it feels like, to tremble with the desire to see my family circle widen, what it feels like to make a life by making love. It's not my unborn children that I see in my lover's eyes, but together we practice an embrace that may someday hold his daughter, alter them from dorms. I Seems like we might be having a connection problem with Carolyn, which is too bad because I was really, really getting into that reading. So, um, so let's let's just pause here for a second and hopefully um, Carolyn can can join us. There's a wonderful, uh, there's a really wonderful um, note in the chat here from Susan Kirkner. Um, and Susan, I'm not sure if you would like to may maybe unmute your camera and and tell us this story about dropping off Carolyn's book with 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 a with a student. Sure, thank you. Uh, Susan Kirchner here. I do Tai Chi with Carolyn's mother and father in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia, and that's how I learned about Carolyn's book. Um, so I just traveled to. Uh, South Carolina to visit my mother and I wanted to take her some barbecue and I stopped at this three piggies barbecue in Roanoke, Virginia and this young girl and I chatted she's majoring in English at University of Maryland College Park um, and she hopes to be a university professor I said oh well I just finished this amazing book and you could tell this young woman had probably not been out of Roanoke very long and so I knew Carolyn's book of adventure would just kind of blow her mind up um, about possibilities of living somewhere else and also writing um, about experiences. So um, I unfortunately gave her the book. I gave it away. So, but, you know, I think that's what it's about, right? I think it's, um, I'm a, I'm a emeriti professor from Towson University. And I think that's what uh, we do as educators. We give we give and receive and uh, rejoice in uh, in that behavior. So I just uh, thought I'd send her a little note on that. Uh, that's such a wonderful story. I love that so much. And also for someone who's considering becoming a teacher, there's so yeah. much teaching craft in this book. Correct. Yeah, yeah abs absolutely. And, wow. and the, the faces, uh, the, what you have to face as a university professor in, during this time, she touched on so many uh, of those issues in her book, yes. Absolutely, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. I think we might have Carolyn back. It looks like, hi, Carolyn, welcome back. Hi, I am so sorry. We just had an internet eruption interruption here. No worries. So, um, so uh, Susan Kirkner was just telling us a, a lovely story about sharing your book with uh with a, a a hopeful future english professor um and there's a there's a, a sweet note about it in the chat um and we all got to hear it but you didn't so you'll have to get in touch with susan to have her regale you with the story if you haven't already that sounds good thank you <laughs> wonderful so let's let's go ahead and get back to your reading thanks everybody for um understanding with the technical difficulties so sorry about that let me pick that let's see if i can pick that up here um I'm just actually coming to the end of this essay, which the last beat here is, for several days after I meet with Chiragi, my browser remains open to the pictures of raccoons. Row on row, the whiskered, bandit-masked faces stare out at me. 
turning their round ears, presenting me with their hand-like paws. Their velvety coats flow over their rounded backs as if holding caught moonlight. They ask me if I did right to supply these ordinary negative contexts for raccoons. Perhaps I did not. I'm grateful for every striped-tailed washer bear, every miraculous promise of this world. And then let me just do the second um, essay. Also winter, it's still wintry here, more snow this weekend. Um, so this is called February, Gun of Innocence. Um, and this is not super violent, but it does discuss, um, does discuss school shootings, um, so fair warning. In early February, every day is startling, hurt your face cold. With casual, steady snowfalls of a few inches a day, we pass 200 inches of snow for the season. While I'm herding McKenna out into the darkness to go to school, I harness the dog and pause to smear my face with a tube of thick sunscreen against the windburned and frostbite. As I drop her off at eight, the sun is finally beginning to rise, revealing a sky of thick, unvarying gray felt. This is what my coworker, writer Lori Anderson, refers to as February's death shroud. It's my third North Country winter, and I have made an uneasy peace with the shroud. Every morning, I take vitamin D with my coffee and take Beckett's ski joring between the high school drop-off and my first English class. In this cold, the snow is so powdery and dry that it sifts over my skis like wisps of cloud, and Beckett doesn't need booties. He's as immune to winter doldrums as he is to views. He takes pleasure in his own muscular exertion in the trail just under his feet. After 10 days with temperatures in the single digits, Lake Superior succumbs. There is 80% ice coverage. I begin to wonder if wolves will walk to Isle Royal again, engineering their own conclusion to years of local debate over introducing additional wolves to bolster the flagging and doomed population there. The freezing of the lake vanquishes our cloud cover and shuts off our snow. Suddenly we have bluebird days, the sky super saturated and cloudless, the snow glittering. Our mornings on the ski trail are drenched in gold light that slants through the trees from the rising sun. We see stars at night again, and McKenna, ever the sky gazer, takes long walks with the dog after dinner time, enjoying the star dazzle. Sometimes we live in such an idyll. On February 14th, a shooter at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, kills 17 people. Douglas's name was once synonymous for me with her book, The Everglades, River of Grass. Now, for all of us, it's synonymous with death. The following day, a student at my daughter's tiny high school enters a classroom and threatens the teacher and students with a school shooting. The threat occurs before 8.30. By 10, it's the talk of the diner downtown, but I don't know this because I'm teaching in my own classroom less than two miles away, not gossiping over coffee and toast. Police and school officials determine that the student is unarmed and that the execution of his classmates is not imminent. They wait until the end of the school day to tell the families, sending us an email referring to the threat as an unfounded rumor of an incident which threatens the safety of our students. After school, I have the following conversation with my daughter. So aside from the threat of massacre, how was your day? Pretty okay. She tells me about her math quiz, a speech she gave in English class, a song she's working on for a solo competition. All this aside from being threatened with death. She was not raised to expect safety. She has already checked her classrooms for night locks, pegs that can secure a door to the floor, and windows she can fit herself out of. She's taken these measures, but I think that she and I are both more occupied with whether she's passing geometry this semester, whether she has all her chemistry homework done, whether she will decide to take the choir trip or go to a martial arts tournament next month. We are so confident that she has this month and this semester and a future about which to make decisions. Many parents keep their children home on Friday. We don't. I don't even get angry until halfway through the day, pattering with my students, many of them Hancock alumni, about how the school administrators denied us parents the opportunity to decide whether our children should spend all of Thursday in a school under threat of massacre while they searched for weapons and for words to minimize what had just occurred. The situation tickles my sense of the absurd, and I take an ironic distance, an ability to laugh at the terrible and intolerable circumstance. The result is much the same as if I were reassured. I keep rendering up my daughter to this unspeakable, unsafe world. In the wake of school shootings, some minds spring toward defending the castle, toward metal detectors, school police officers, 
arming teachers or, more plausibly, allowing teachers who are already trained to bear arms into their classrooms. Both my husband and Andrew Pollock, who lost his daughter, Meadow, at Parkland, are of this view. I resonate instead with the Parkland survivors like X. Gonzalez and David Hogg, who want to see more restrictive gun laws regarding gun purchasing, background checks, and high-capacity magazines. I'm with the peacenik teachers who want to do their life-honoring educational work without an instrument of death tucked in their waistbands. I'm with everyone who worries about what armed teachers and more police in schools mean for the safety of students of color already facing the yawning mouth of the school-to-prison pipeline. With my letters, phone calls, postcards, and petitions, I push one way. With his NRA membership and efforts to educate his younger friends in responsible gun ownership, my husband pushes the other. It seems to me that the Parkland shooter had sufficient firearm safety and markmanship training on his NRA-sponsored school rifle team. Our little family is at cross purposes, like our nation. On March 5th, the Florida State Senate passes an incoherent compromise, raising the gun purchasing age to 21, banning bump stocks, funding more school resource officers, and allowing some teachers to carry guns. In her poem, Gun of Wishes, Vivi Francis articulates an American ideal, a gun you can carry anywhere, and no one minds your gun of good intentions. My husband is a fan of the idea of constitutional carry, meaning he dreams of a land where citizens may carry their handguns concealed and permitless across state lines from coast to coast. Francis' poem unmasks this facet of American exceptionalism, a collective dream of a land where violence or the tools of violence can be protective, redemptive, and regenerative. My husband carries a gun of good intentions. He waits in all solemnity for a day when he might need to use it to protect others. We both hope that this detail, dropped into the story of our lives like Chekhov's gun, will disappoint the title pull of narrative and remain forever unused. Francis, born in West Texas, before becoming a longtime resident of Hamtramck, an enclave of Detroit, has bridged and understood American gun cultures, hunting and handgun, as I'm only just beginning to. She sends it up, all of it. Gun of innocence, that's the gun for me one that takes out the enemy with bullets of care. I saw Frances perform this poem once, her voice a rising chant that filled the auditorium, an incantation that nonetheless asked its listeners to break the spell. Violence is just violence. There are no bullets of care. Go armed or go naked. This world is sometimes too violent to be born. Thank you.